turn things over to Dr. Bowie. Okay, so maybe I can just start by thanking uh, the organizers, Keith and everyone involved in uh, putting this fantastic conference together. And Megan as well, who's been emailing us to make sure we do everything on time. So uh, in terms of my first slide. So I got interested in grin disorders from a funny kind of place, actually. Let's get the first slide. I'm going to do it by interpretive dance. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want you to be saying that, trust me. Well, maybe I'll say before the slide comes up, we, we were actually interested in a number of neurodevelopmental disorders. And then in the lab where we were chatting about it, we actually thought, you know, if you look at the clinical phenotype of these disorders, then there's a lot of things that are very similar to each other. And so we thought that maybe, although there's going to be some differences, obviously differences in, in the molecular origin of the disorder, then we thought that it's probably there's going to be some common things that you can find in them. And so that was our starting point. And so that's why I've got this title. So I think this is the laser pointer. Uh, we look at a number of neuro, neurodevelopmental disorders, but I'm actually going to tell you about Fragile X syndrome, which will sound like a funny thing to be talking about in a crowd, that, which has spent a lot of time thinking about grin disorders. But I'm going to make the argument that I think there's a lot of things in Fragile X that you can learn playing into grin disorders. So before I do that, let me just make a disclaimer. So I should know that I'm helped co-found a company called NOS Pharma, and I'm the CSO of that company. And the focus of that company is on uh, rare neurological disorders, right? So we've had a long held interest in this. So what's GRIN got to do with Fragile X? So we were interested in Fragile X, and what we noticed, you know, I teach um, uh, medical students as well at McGill. Uh, and when you actually look at the clinical profile of kids with Fragile X, just like it was mentioned this morning uh, in, in some of the discussions about uh, clinical features of GRIN, there's a lot of overlapping features with neurodevelopmental disorders. And so this audience, I don't need to point out for cognitive development, learning difficulties, uh, social anxiety, uh, aggression, that was a kind of thing that we picked up on as being a kind of interesting thing that gives a clue to what we might be looking at. Uh, of course, there's important differences in Fragile X. It's all tied into this fMR1 gene, which makes a protein called fMRP. And then the other thing that clicked our imagination was that fMRP is often found in, in glutamatergic synapses, which is an RNA binding protein. It does other things that we've uncovered, it turns out. But we thought glutamatergic synapses, grin disorders, glutamatergic synapses. So that's another tick in the column of maybe there's some commonalities. And then another thing, which is the reason why I'm all here, there isn't really much therapy for all of these different kinds of conditions. So we were really interested in, can we come up with some common elements that are undoubtedly a little bit different when you look at the disorders, but some common elements that we could actually uh, find out and maybe even develop some therapeutics towards them. So rather than jumping into uh, the cortex, the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex, which all, everybody else seemed to be doing at the time, so this is like six, seven years ago, we said, well, if we do that, we're only going to find what everybody else is finding in these disorders. So why don't we take a, a slightly different approach to things? So we, we turned our attention to the cerebellum, which may seem a bit funny for some people in the audience, but actually made a lot of sense to us for a couple of reasons. The first reason is, is that the cerebellum develops postnatally, so it develops after birth. And so that's kind of an interesting thing if you're interested in doing the kind of things that Lonnie, uh, Lonnie's interested in, in terms of the development. But there was also this emerging idea, mainly coming out of a clinical work and, and, and looking at patients, is that as the cerebellum develops postnatally, it actually drives the information out of the cerebellum that helps drive, uh, helps drive the maturation of much higher centers, so the cortex and things like that. So we thought, well, that's a really interesting hypothesis. So we had some expertise in cerebellum, so we thought, well, why don't we look at that? And so then the question is, which cell do you look at? So everybody would immediately think about, we should look at the Purkinje cells because that's the main output cell from the cerebellar cortex. But we said, well, actually, you know what? Actually, maybe a better thing is to go for the traffic cop. And the traffic cop in the cerebellum are these uh, molecular layer interneurons, and particularly stellate cells. And so we thought, if that's really true, because I always have to convince people in my lab to do an experiment that lasts about one day, otherwise the project falls. I said, if that's really true, if we record from molecular layer interneurons, then we should immediately start to see defects in glutamatergic transmission, right? It should be that easy. So it was a one-off one day experiment uh, to do that. And that's exactly what we found. 
So uh, the way that we did these experiments, so this is just for people who do electrophysiology here. So the molecular layer engineers, so the stellate, stellate cells, receive both glutamatergic and GABAergic inhibition. So if we stimulate the parallel fibers, which are the axons that come from the, um, the stellate cell, uh, from the granule cell, sorry, then you not only do a glutamate transition, but through the action of uh, inhibitory interneurons, you also get GABAergic responses. And so what happens when you, you actually record from these cells? So the first thing we see straight away in the first day of recordings is that we look at the wild type cells. So here's a wild type mouse. Uh, and then right next to it, you could see a couple of really important things which have spent a bunch of years trying to understand what this really means. So the first thing is you can see that the amplitude of the evoked EPSP, so this is mediated by alpha receptors that are in these stellate cells, the NMD receptors are extrasynaptic. And there's also a little bit of a larger inhibitory component, although at least statistically it wasn't significant. But the other thing is you can see that the alpha receptor component is much briefer, quite a lot briefer in nature, right? And there's a whole reasoning why that has that why that occurs and so we said to ourselves, well hold on this is in current clamp but uh, you know maybe other things contributing to this so why don't we voltage clamp these cells and then we can record the amp occurrence directly and see if this is due to differences in the number of amp receptors per synapse and so when we did that what we found uh, disappointing to me but perhaps not surprising people in the lab is that the wild type amper receptor response and the amper receptor response that we found in our fragile X mice were identical to each other, identical in every way. And since my lab spent a lot of time thinking about amper receptors, this was a bit of a, a disappointing. But the interesting thing is when we looked at the NMD receptors, so here's the wild type NMD receptors, you get this enormous response if you drive the spillover of glutamate from these synapses, but in fragile X, just like you see in hyperfunctioning grin disorders, so this is the link to grin disorders, you get a much, much smaller NMD receptor response. You have to really drive the whole thing to see that. Now, if you try to augment glutamate transmission so that it spills over further, then it doesn't change the amplitude of this. So it's not because of the, the misplacement of glutamate receptors, NMD receptors in these. So we did something surprising at this point, at least for people in my lab, I said, well, look, hold on, let's, let's go back to the wild type mouse and try to understand what on earth are these NMD receptors doing in the wild type mouse. And so if you follow the work that we've done over the last six or seven years, then we've mapped out this whole kind of uh, bunch of roles that NMD receptors do. And we've, we think we've sort of stumbled upon a kind of putative homeostatic mechanism by which NMD receptors are at the center of this uh, homeostatic mechanism. So Sean, oops, sorry, apologies, I had to go back. Here we go. So the NMD receptor, which is center stage here, uh, regulates the firing properties of cells through voltage-gated sodium channels. It changes their biophysical properties. So we published a couple of papers on that. It does it through CAM kinase too. This is a super NMD receptor because not only does it do that over a slightly slower time scale, working through neural nitric oxide synthase, which reduces nitric oxide, elevates cyclic GMP, then it actually causes the strengthening of inhibitory GABA receptors. So on the one hand, it drives up the excitability of the cell, and over a slightly slower time, it actually brings the cell's excitability down, right? So that's why we think it's homeostatic. But here's the other interesting twist, is that the nitric oxide is produced from the action of NOS, drifts over into local capillaries, and causes vasodilation. And so what I'm going to show you, I'm only going to show you part of the story, what we know is that because that NMD receptor function is much, much, much reduced in these stellate cells, then all of these mechanisms are completely gone in the fragile X mouse. And we think that's significant because we think this homeostatic mechanism is repeated all the way across the brain. And so that's why we think it's significant. And that's why we think it ties into grain disorders. So let me tell you a little bit more about, I'm, going to, I'm not gonna be able to tell you about uh, the work on the sodium channels or even the work we've done on these blood vessels. I'm gonna tell you about this because this is in itself is a little complicated story. So in terms of strengthening GABA transmission, uh, the conventional view of things is, you know, you uh, stimulate. So this is just control conditions. If you do this high frequency stimulation that gets activation of NMD receptors and you got the carbon current, then you don't see much. And it's only when you pair it by depolarizing, where you leave this magnesium block work that Graham and other people have shown many, many years ago, you get this nice potentiation of a GABA current, not amper currents, but of the GABA current in these cells. If you put BAPT in, you lose the whole thing. Now, what's surprising about that, which surprised us at the time, and it led us to start to think about therapy, 
was that when you actually tease apart, so I'm summarizing work that was already published, but we found that these extrasynaptic receptors do this by coupling up not to CAM kinase 2, but to what's thought to be the bad boy of signaling in cells, because the NNOS has been tied into neurotoxicity in stroke models. But in fact, the nitric oxide, which produces cyclic GMP through all this pathway, I'm not going to take you through it, causes the strengthening of these inhibitory GABA uh, synapses. But there's another twist. There's a couple of twists. The first thing, it's not through Jeffrin, which is the conventional view in which everyone argues is the case, it's actually through GABA-RAP, which was the original GABA receptor uh, binding auxiliary protein. And, and there's another type of uh, inhibitory GABA receptor expressed in these stellate cells. And we worked all this out by looking at uh, knockout mouse. But the plasticity, so the strengthening that you've seen back here, all of this is due to the insertion of alpha-3 containing receptors, but the alpha-1 is left untouched. And that was very, very surprising to us, that why would you have this dominant alpha-1 receptor, which dominates synaptic, uh, synaptic transmission uh, under basal conditions, but yet you get this insertion of these alpha-3. So what it says to us, that maybe these are silent synapses, just like what you see at glutamatergic synapses. Maybe these synapses here aren't really present, but it's only when you drive this plasticity mechanism that you get an insertion of the gamma receptors. So how do you show that? So the way we did it is we stimulated, whoops, let me go back. We stimulated um, these NMD receptors, but what, we then turned down the intensity of the stimulus of the GABA response. So instead of seeing a GABA response every single time, you would see every, second or third time. So, you, so if there was insertion of GABA receptors then you could see more synaptic events occurring and that's exactly what we've seen. So here's an example of the experiment. So here's baseline conditions. We then do a high frequency stimulation here. You can see there's a whole bunch of failures. There's some synaptic events. So it's like a half and half, that kind of thing. You drive the stimulation of NMD receptors. And then you look at the effect of uh, post uh, after post high frequency stimulation you don't see a change in the amplitude of the synaptic events, but you see many, many more failures, less failures, many less failures, suggesting that we've uncovered these silent synapses. In other words, alpha-3 receptors have been put into these synapses, okay? So that was a significant thing to us. So if I can kind of formalize this a little bit more for all the synaptic physiology people in the audience, which is shown here. It's not moving to the next slide. You're going to have to trust me on this one. <laughs> okay. No, the laser's working. So this is a more formalized way to show it. So this is just the data I showed you before. See a lot of failures. Exactly the same recording now, right? But you see there's many, many more events after you stimulate these NMD receptors. So you can block with NMD blockers. But now look at fewer failures. You get a many, many, many more events. So if you do this multiple times or for different cell types, what you see is you get the insertion of more receptors. But the other thing is you get insertion of synaptic events. You get many, many slow decay kinetics. And that's a, that's a, a fingerprint of these alpha-3 containing receptors because they're slow decaying alpha-3 receptors. So something that we didn't notice at the time, we actually discovered this post hoc actually, was if you look very carefully in the wild type. So here's the wild type before the stimulus. You, you can see we can get occasionally get these very big events of two nanoamps. But after the high frequency stimulation, not only do we get uh, more insertion of these small alpha-3 containing receptors, but we actually start to lose the big events. You see that? So you start to lose those big events. So I wasn't completely convinced, but it's only when we started to look at the fragile X mouse, we realized that something was going on. So just to uh, summarize what I just said to you about the wild type. So we had to go off and discover new bits of biology, the wild type. In the alpha-3 synapses, we think that there are, let's call them putatively silent synapses. There might be some alpha-3 receptors there but they definitely accumulate more alpha-3 receptors once you stimulate them through the NMD receptor. However, what we find with the alpha-1 containing receptors, which in previous publications, we thought they were just bystanders not doing very much, but in fact, there's a kind of depression going on there. And you might say, since I have Steve and Graham and a whole bunch of experts in the room on synaptic transmission, might say, why the hell would you do that? Why would you bother to that? But it turns out the alpha-3s get much, much slower time course of decay kinetics. So if you put alpha-3 in, you take out alpha-1, then inhibitory potential takes much, much longer to recover back to baseline. So it's a real advantage in terms of synaptic transmission. So what about fragile X? So what we thought is, well, in fragile X, we 
there's a, a poor AMD receptor response, so we don't expect to get any potentiation. So in fact, when I say to people lab, you should just go out and do the experiment, you're not gonna see any change. Nothing's gonna change because there's no plasticity, but that's actually not what happened. And that's when things started to get really interesting. So what we found when we look at the Fragile X mice, so you can see the basal conditions, you can see they're a little bit different from what we recorded before in the wild type, fewer big, big events, right? But when we stimulated, rather than getting a potentiation, which you get wild type, you actually get more failures, but you also start to lose events from it. It's not like nothing happened, but you actually start to lose synaptic events. So if I can move to the next part of it. So here's just a comparison here. So I'm kind of trivializing a little bit. So I apologize to all the synaptic experts here. But here's the wild time just to show a comparison of what I showed you before. Here's after, uh, when you stimulate, so you get many, many more small events, right? Remember I told you about that? You don't have them here, but you got them here. You lose these bigger events. We think these are alpha-1 receptors disappearing. But in fragile X, even under basal conditions, there's fewer events from the beginning. So this means there's something that's interfering the basal conditions from the very beginning in these kids. Right? And then when you stimulate, you actually make things work. So the very process is trying to drive a learning mechanism. Not only is it not happening, but it's actually detrimental to the learning mechanism. You see, it's actually pulling the GABA receptors that you're trying to put on the surface. It's actually pulling them off, right? So just to summarize that, which is shown here. So the alpha-3 receptors, we think that nothing's happening to them. However, the, the main thing that's actually the big phenotype in the alpha and the uh, Fragile X mouse is that the alpha one containing GABA receptor synapses, there's this exaggerated form of ILTD. And we think it's exaggerated because we've done these experiments in alpha three knockout mice. So when you get alpha three knockout mice, then you still get LTD, but it's not as severe. So we think there's something in addition in the lack of FMRP that makes this ILTD. So this is GABAergic ILTD, not the LTD that Mark Baer talked about. It's much more exaggerated, right? So how do you move forward, right? So what we do know is that the strengthening of the synapses here is mediated by nitric oxide and uh, cyclic GMP, goes through protein energy, there's a whole bunch of things. And so I teach medical students. So I said, you know what guys, and, and it took me time to convince them, if we use Viagra, because it blocks uh, phosphodiesterase phosphodiesterase five, and that will prolong cyclic GMP, just like what it does for all those people who happily take Viagra, then we should be able to boost this. And there was laughs around the lab for about three days or something. But anyway, they tried it and it turns out it works, right? But that's probably not gonna correct this, but I'll just show you what happens when you use sildenafil, which is the, uh, the medical term for Viagra. So this is what we see next. So here is the baseline with uh, sildenafil, okay? Here's the baseline here. Now we drive the, this, the transmission, whereas before you actually lost synaptic events, you now start to get these events back and you start to get these alpha-3 containing GABA receptors back. But what that does is just bring you back to where you were at the beginning. It doesn't give you the potentiation you expect to see. And so I'm going to jump over a bunch of experiments just to tell you the result. What we concluded is that maybe this is an mglur 5 mediated LTD mechanism a bit similar to what people had already described in glutamatergic synapses. So if we use an mglur 5 antagonist, MPEP, that we just happen to have around, and we combine it with sildenafil, I'm not have going to be of time to be able to show you both of them, then we should be able to not only get this, but we should actually block the LTD that's gone on the alpha-1 containing synapses. And that's exactly what we got. So here it's here. So here's the combination. With sildenafil in, you see that there's more synaptic events now again, because sildenafil is working in the background. You put the block the mglur 5 and uh, inhibit phosphodiesterase 5. Remember, these are all only, the, the sildenafil is only in the patch electrode, so it's not across the whole slice. The MPEP is across the whole slice. But you can see you get many, many, many more events that you would have got in the absence of that. So you can reverse it with this kind of combination therapy to do that, right? So you might say, well, I'll just, hold on, let me just summarize that. I think it's a little cartoon. So here's our summary. So whereas before in the Fragile X, you could not potentiate these alpha-3 containing synapses. Now with uh, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibition, you can actually bring it back. So we think you can rescue that. And it ties into Lonnie's idea that there's maybe defects within inhibitory transmission. But the other thing that nobody has really thought about is that not only are these 
GABA receptors get inserted, but they're being pulled off at the same time it fragile X. And you can prevent that if you combine it with drugs that block MGLR5. And so we can kind of get almost back to the restored situation. So in the last two minutes, I just want to explain to you why we think this is not something unique to the stellate cell and the cerebellum at this particular time point. And there's two kind of very simple reasons for that. The first thing is if you look at the expression of NOS, so neural nitric oxide synthase, which is biochemically coupled to NMD receptors, you know, David Brett had shown that a long time ago with Saul Snyder. Um, then the first thing is if you look at the expression of NOS, so this is actually from David and Saul's uh, original paper that was in Neuron, uh, using in situ hybridization, you can see that there's a lot of NOS expressed in the cerebellum. So we made a good choice onto the cerebellum. It's only expressed in two cell types in the cerebellum, actually, in the stellate cells and the granule cells. Granule cells are very abundant, so you can see that kind of a profound effect. But it's everywhere. I mean, it's olfactory bulbs. So this is a rodent. Uh, it's in the cortex, certain types of cells, mainly in the interneurons in the cortex. And uh, it's also found in the hippocampus. It's all over the brain. So you can imagine that this kind of uh, homeostatic mechanism may be being repeated all across the brain. It's just that it slipped through under everybody's radar because we haven't bothered to tie these things together. Okay. The other thing that kind of made us kind of convinced that this might be interesting, we've been doing a whole bunch of behavioral experiments, but I'm just going to show you some of these things. If you look at just a bunch of behavioral tests where someone has done it in a fragile X knockout mouse and looked at the same uh, behavior in patients with fragile X, but then if you look at an NNOS knockout mouse, so this is a mouse that can't make nitric oxide, at least in coupling to NMD receptors, then you see there's a lot of pretty good correlation between them. And remember, we talked about aggression. So uh, nitric oxide and cyclic GMP signaling has been tied into actually aggression, especially in males. So if you get the NNOS knockout mouse, then these male mice are actually very aggressive, right? And it's tied into the expression of testosterone and nitric oxide, some kind of uh, signaling going on now that makes the male mice, at least in the end, NOS knockout mouse, much, much more aggressive. And that was something that came up with some of the patients today. So does that tie into what we see uh, with kids in grin disorders? I don't know. But you can see that made us sort of think that cyclic GMP, nitric oxide sing uh, signaling, may be very important also in grin disorders if you have a hyperfunction in NMD receptors, right? So with that, I want to thank everybody who's involved in this. So there's a bunch of people. Michael Cardi really started the wild, wild type work uh, with Ryan Alexander and then Arjun, Ajay, Alexia, Megan, Heike, and uh, somebody else have been involved in looking at the Fragile X. We've also had a whole bunch of collaborations in trying to do that. So thanks for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. Really nice talk, Derek. Um, pretty interesting stuff there. Uh, I just, you might you might have guessed I was going to ask you about the NMDA receptors, but do, do you have some data or speculation on what's changing in those stellate cells and the knockout mouse versus your wild type, both synaptic and, you know, the parasynaptic guys yeah. that Stuart used to work yeah. on? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. And so it may be the hardest one to, to answer, actually. Um, there might be a couple of things going on. So I didn't tell you about all the blood vessel work that we've done. So the, this seems to be involved in astrocytes in there, and that somehow may be impacting the expression of NMD receptors in neuron. There's also work done by, um, um, I would call them, forget, but all on the neuroligands, uh, to do with neuroligands. And they have shown in stellate cells a certain neuroligands that regulate um, the expression of NMD receptors. And I think it was neuroligand 3, I may be getting the number wrong, but neuroligand 3 has also been tied into neurodevelopmental disorders as well. So. Uh, it could be one of those mechanisms. We're trying to kind of parse our way through them. Yeah. Do you, do you have a favorite subunit you think is coming up or going down? Well, you know, that's Glue a good question. The, well, the thing is, this is a Superman NMD receptor. It's tying up to CAM kinase 2 and it's tying up to MNOS. We think there's probably more than one NMD receptor in these cells. And they may be working through different effector mechanisms. We don't know that yet, but if you look in the literature and you look at RNA-seq data, that would be such a uh, surprising I mean, how otherwise would the channel, you know, one to sodium channels and then one's the GABAergic transmission? We don't know. Other questions? But, but maybe I could, because you're interested in this, probably, it's the probably trihetromeric. That's my guess. Well, that's you're, you're, yes. 2, 2B, 
Yeah, yeah, two T step. Two T step. There you go. Would you be able to share um, the blood vessel work you've done? I, I don't have the slides here, mm -hmm. um, but what we've been able to do is to measure it. So we, we think it. We, I, it's too early to talk about it, but what we know is that you do not get the vasodilation, but we know how to recover it. And it, you don't need the MGLR5, but you need, uh, you need some other things in addition to uh, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors. And have you seen any, um, I guess, enlarged blood vessels since they're not able to? Yeah, no, it's a great question as well. So the whole, I don't know if you follow that, that work, but there's a whole debate on where does the... Um, where does the vasodilation, vasoconstriction work? And it looks like with blood vessels, they can go up or down. There's this rather complicated um, uh, uh, kind of regulation. In our case, we can clearly see the parasites are vasodilating, vasoconstricting. Uh, because we're using uh, brain slices, at least in those experiments, we have to pre-constrict with a uh, thromboxin A2 agonist, which is a conventional thing to do. And then when you stimulate the NMD receptors, you see this very dramatic dilation, and then you wash mm -hmm. it NMDA, it goes back to it. You see the red blood cells try to pass through. It's it's really uh, striking, but it's completely gone and fragile. Mm -hmm. um, are you doing like real experiments to prove the antagonism of uh, MGLUR5 plus the Viagra? We, we are, so, so some of this has been translated out. Uh, so McGill felt that there was some intellectual property here mm -hmm. and uh, they don't have the deep pockets unlike maybe some of the US universities to do that. So that would be done out, outside that. So yes, we've done some behavior experiments. Okay. It's probably too early to talk about it, but. So, so we know Viagra is uh, brain penetrant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Viagra may not be the right one to use okay, for, for pharmacokinetic reasons, but um, yes, yeah, brain penetrant and, um, uh, you know, the MGLUR effect, you know, Mark Baird did a very comprehensive study of MGLUR effects. Uh, the phosphodase 5 inhibitors seem to be targeting things that you don't get with the MGLUR5, so it's a complementary. Other questions? And anywhere? Okay, I didn't see anything online. If we can thank our speakers. Thank you.